Hi everyone, Professor King here. Uh, you can see I'm wearing a hoodie because it's pretty cold in my house. Uh, my dogs are also acting a little wacky. So if they bark in this video, I apologize beforehand, uh, but it is raining. So everyone's a little cooped up here. Um, anyway, you know, I, I tell myself I shouldn't read the comments on my videos because it's people who oddly enough, come off as even more insane than I do, if that's even possible. But then I read them and I'm like, cool, just a bunch of more people with exercised and internalized misogyny jumping on a woman who's sharing her educated opinions on a topic. <laughs> Fun. <laughs> Anyway, uh, in this video, we're going to be talking about Herman Melville's short story, Bartleby the Scrivener. Um, no, I did not date Mel Melville. Uh, we weren't best friends. We didn't hang out on a regular basis. But I do have some extensive literary knowledge of him because I have a master's in English from a reputable university. So, um, yeah, if you're going to just you know, try and jump on me because you assume that I know or don't know things based on a 20 minute video. You should probably look elsewhere to jump on someone because <laughs> I'm over it, to be honest with you. That being said, for those of you who are actually my students and watching these videos because, uh, you know, they, they initiate discussions within the courses that I am more than qualified to teach, with my, you know, 20 some odd years of education and 13 years of teaching experience. Uh, if you're one of those people coming to this class for those reasons, you're in the right place. The rest of you, like I said, do something fun. <laughs> Why are you watching me? I don't even know you. <laughs> go, go like, I don't know. Buy an elliptical machine, like go for a hike. Go to a free museum that hasn't like pilfered the belongings of, you know, some unfortunate group throughout history that it's not willing to give those items back to. I don't know what to tell you. I'm just here teaching English classes and uh, hopefully people are getting something out of them. But uh, anyway, I think I've already said anyway, like three times. So I'll actually mean it this time and take it to the share screen in a moment. But before I do for, again, my students, which is who this page is for, not really anyone else. Uh, if you have questions or concerns or comments, please feel free to email me, Canvas message me, uh, visit me during my Zoom office hours. I hate pronto, so don't do that because you'll never get a response. Um, and don't comment on here <laughs> because it's honestly just, a wasteland of people with axes to grind that have nothing to do with me, but see me as some sort of dartboard upon which to project their angst. So um, I'll take it to a share screen now. We're gonna talk Bartleby and uh, yeah. All right, no, okay. So Bartleby the Scrivener is a short story written by Herman Melville, published in 1853. Uh, I'm not going to give you a ton of biographical background on Melville because there is exactly that, probably a ton if you printed it out. A uh, very prolific writer, clearly the guy who wrote Moby Dick, also wrote other uh, famous, interesting stories like Billy Budd and what we have here and tons more. So if you want, you know, if this, if this story spoke to you, uh, check them out. One thing I, well, I'll get there in a sec. Um, just make sure you know, this is, you know, since it's published in 1853, it's an older story of what some would consider considerable page length. So make sure that you read carefully and thoroughly, uh, read, uh, reread and review your annotations and highlights that you should be doing as you're reading the story once you finish, because they'll provide you with not only documentation, but items to review and reflect upon as you're considering writing your discussion board and also perhaps developing your ideas into a larger essay for the midterm. Also pay particular attention to unfamiliar words, 
to allusions, which is just a fancy literary term for references that you may not have previously known. Because this is written in the 19th century, there are turns of phrase, there is vocabulary, there's are, there are just ways of saying things that are quite different to the way that we say them in 2021 and beyond. So make sure that, again, you are grappling with the text. Am I asking you to be, to be a Melville scholar? No. Am I asking you to know every single thing about this text in Melville? I'm asking you to read it and grapple with it, which is a very different thing than to be an expert, quote unquote. So keep that in mind. And this little infographic here has all kinds of helpful ways of what smart reading looks like or what uh, active reading looks like. So keep, keep those items on the left there in mind as well. We've already talked about them in class a lot, so I won't belabor those points too much. So one thing I did want to say about Melville, I said I wasn't going to go into depth about Melville, um, but one thing I do want to say that I think pertains specifically to this story is that one, if you want to call it a theme or a motif, one thing that Melville was interested in uh, is the, the notion of mutinies in, in real life and in, in fiction. Uh, I mentioned Billy Budd before in the, 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 Billy Budd is essentially like a novella, meaning it's somewhere between a short story and a novel. And it has to do with uh, a mutiny that is trying to be navigated throughout the story. Uh, and if we think about Bartleby, right? Bartleby doesn't take place on a ship. It takes place in Wall Street in a very corporate environment, uh, corporate for 1853, which is, uh, in some ways not as corporate, but in other ways just as corporate as the world we're seeing in 2021. And think about what might a corporate mutiny in an office space look like. Uh, it may not have the same grittiness or uh, hyper-masculine elements of a 19th century mutiny on a ship, but there are things that we want to uh, or not we, I wouldn't say we, because I'm not going to include myself in that sort of corporate world mentality, but if, but people in the corporate world, right, there, there are things that they want to do or that they want to avoid uh, so that things run smoothly in the office, just like uh, people who are avoiding a mutiny want to keep things running smoothly on a ship. And <clears throat> just like in Billy Budd, we've got this man in a position of authority, just a nameless narrator, uh, <clears throat> who becomes sort of transfixed with a character that he can't control. In Billy Budd, the guy's nickname is Jemmy Legs, and he's kind of a jerk. And in this one, we have our narrator who becomes transfixed with Bartleby for various reasons. So thinking about those reasons and thinking about the story itself, uh, I want you to consider some literary terms that we've talked about in the course thus far, uh, and some that we have not. And think about how they relate to the story. The first one being repetition. So there are certain terms or certain phrases that are repeated throughout this story. And the first ones you might think of are like, oh, the characters' names. Well, yes, of course, right? If characters do things, they have to be signaled, right? That they are doing it. But I'm talking more about conceptual repetition. Uh, so you see it, the repetition of certain words in adjectival or noun form a lot. Uh, the first one being clearly prefer, right? Or preference in relation to no right? or not, uh, which is an interesting connection that we're making there. The next one is imagine and imagination, particularly as that pertains to the narrator, but not only the narrator, there are other characters who engage in, let's just call it imaginative thinking. And then the words assume and assumption, and those are repeated throughout the story as well. Now, again, we have to think about these words in relation to the characters that they are attached to. We know that Bartleby is the character who repeats 
throughout the story, I would prefer not to, or some, some iteration of it. But if we think about the narrator who is telling this story, he's also repeating certain terms. And so if we think about what happens when we repeat terms, well, they become solidified, but sometimes they also become sort of meaningless. They also could be repeated because we are trying to convince ourselves of something that we are or, or that we are doing. Uh, and if we're, we're repeating these sort of narratives to ourselves about who we are and what we're doing and why we're doing it, then maybe we're trying to prove something to ourselves. Uh, <laughs> I know in a previous comment, someone said that I don't know Cicero at all. And I just, I must be so stupid, right? Like in this tiny little woman brain, there's just air floating between my two ear holes. Uh, Cicero is mentioned in here too, as well as other rhetors. And I know this is not the English 103 course, which focuses much more heavily on rhetoric. But if we think about the, the notion of rhetoric and persuasion, and how people are persuading and how people are persuaded, how people persuade, whom they are persuading, whether it be themselves or somebody else, what they do or do not do to persuade, we can start to think about the relevance of these repeated terms. Uh, I already mentioned characters, but we've got some <laughs> really great characters in this short story. Uh, clearly the narrator, then we have his sort of minions, we'll call them, right? Turkey, nippers, and ginger nut. And the interesting thing is that, that um, I don't know if you noticed, but they each kind of uh, have an age plus a little bit. If I'm, I'm, I'm not a math person, so I hope that makes sense. But each one he introduces, right? Turkey is, I think, 60. Uh, nippers is 25. And then ginger nut is 12. So it's almost like he took their ages, half them, halved them, and then took off a few more years or at least a year, uh, which I think is kind of weird, right? But maybe there's something to that. Maybe I'm just uh, a psychopath. Uh, we have Bartleby, right? Wonderful Bartleby. And then we have Mr. Cutlets. And so if we think about this as sort of a microcosm of these characters that orbit this universe, uh, we have to think about their positionality and where they orbit the universe of this office. Because most of the activity in this short story takes place in the first office that they have. Uh, and so Bartleby kind of comes in and stands as like, he's like the jar in Tennessee, right? He, he sort of, <laughs> he sort of sets up shop literally in this, in this place and serves as this sort of, uh, thing upon which other people project various elements of their personalities. And so we'll talk more about that in a moment. We have the setting, which is not just New York in the 1850s, but also consider uh, more detailed descriptive settings within the scenes and vignettes. There's a beautiful description of Bartle. It's not even an office, right? It's like, <laughs> it's like a, a partition. Uh, between a wall and, and, a, and a, I don't know, partition. Uh, you know, it's like this tiny little area that has a window, right? Even though the window looks out to nothing. It's very bleak. Uh, that is beautifully described in this story. And it really gives you a sense of the tone of uh, that, that, that Melville is trying to achieve, but also the living conditions under which these characters labor. So setting is important. Uh, the broader setting of Wall Street, and then the more intimate setting of the office itself. Uh, I did just mention tone, right? Think about the ironic or comedic tone of Bartleby, and I hope you picked up on some of those really biting, sarcastic, incisive moments where we see that that kind of comedic or sorry, that that sort of tone um, versus the the tone of the other short story we're reading this week, which is those who walk away from Amelis. Uh, those who walk away from Amelis has a much more serious tone. It sort of, the story takes itself more seriously, whereas this has got definite elements of silliness, despite all of the kind of crummy stuff that happens throughout the story. And then finally, uh, not finally, because this is, we've got a whole nother page of this, but finally for this page, imagery. Um, you know, an imagery is is unique to the reader. So I won't bring up too many images. I've already talked about some of the images, but I want you to think of some of the ones that spoke to you and not just visual imagery, but all of the sensory imagery that I've talked about in previous 
uh, lessons in previous videos. Uh, what descriptions stuck out to you, right? What did they make you think or feel? What did you apply? If, you, if you're thinking about, you know, this story from 1853 and, and trying to sort of find parallels in the modern world, what modern parallels did they make you think of? Uh, how did they contribute to the overall impression of the story? Um, there's, you know, even though this is a, a more dark humor sort of story, there is this really beautiful imagery in the final scenes of the story. And I won't give too much away, but uh, the narrator sees Bartleby and the setting that is described is both uh, sad, the word melancholy, right? Melancholy is another one of those repeated terms throughout this story. It's melancholic, but it's also in a way kind of beautiful in its sadness, if that makes any sense. And it contributes to the final effect that Melville wants to have, the final way in which we see Bartleby through the narrator's eyes. Uh, and then how do, how do these relate to other literary elements such as tone, right? Such as how we perceive the characters, uh, such as how we consider the plot, et cetera, et cetera. All right, so next page of literary terms. We have symbolism, simile, and metaphor. Uh, I don't know if I've talked about this in a previous video, but <clears throat> Noam Chomsky, very famous uh, linguist, but also political theorist, he talks about how the thing that, that separates humans from animals is our ability for abstract thought, meaning, uh, we can essentially uh, derive very complex meaning from items that represent something else. Nietzsche talks about this too, right? In truth and falsi falsity in an ultra moral sense. Uh, but, you know, this idea that what makes us humans, one of the things, one of the sort of markers that sets us apart from other animals is that we are, you know, not only do we have a, a very extensive spoken language, and sets of spoken languages, but we're able to think about, uh, consider objects, right? And they don't even have to be tangible objects that we see in this case, they're objects that we imagine because we're reading them and they stand in for something else, right? And that's what really what's at the heart of not only symbolism, but simile and metaphor is something standing in or com being compared to something else in an abstract or novel way. Uh, so, the question is what images or items from the text serve as stand-ins or abstract representations of something else? Uh, and what is the meaning or what is the connotation? Meaning what is the uh, parallel? What's the thing we're relating it to? And how, how does it relate? And why is that significant? If that's the specific language Melville is using, what feeling or thought or state of mind is he trying to evoke in us using this symbol, using this metaphor? Uh, the other term we have is irony, right? Um, and irony, I've talked about dramatic irony before, but really irony is, is that there is a disconnect between what is expected and what is actually happening or what happens. Uh, dramatic irony specifically talks about how the, the players on the stage or the actors, the characters in a scene uh, do not know things that we as the audience do. <clears throat> and so in terms of irony, where do we see events that stand in contrast to what we expect uh, or to what other characters in the work know? And so, <laughs> uh, you know, when we get to about halfway through the story, when uh, we find, I'll just say that we find Bartleby in the office. And I won't say any more than that. Uh, yes, in one sense, we expect Bartleby to be in the office, but do we expect him to be in the office in the capacity he's in the office, on the day he's in the office, in the clothing he's wearing, uh, the things that are in the office with him, do we expect that? And so why would that come off as perhaps comedic or sarcastic or novel or engaging or interesting? Um, plot. So in in the sort of typical, 
plot direction that we see in, in most narrative storytelling and most drama, dramatic works, uh, we start with exposition, meaning we're being exposed to the setting, exposed to the characters, exposed to uh, the premises, in other words, like the things that we all need to know in order for the story to move forward. Then we've got some rising action. And in this case, the rising action would be things like Bartleby getting hired and uh, the way in which Bartleby interacts not only with the narrator, his boss, but also people like Turkey and Nippers, right? Then we have the climax. And I, my question to you is like, what do you think the climax in this story is? It's a very odd story and it is of considerable length. So when does the climax occur in your estimation? The thing that, and again, if we think about the climax, it's the point of no return, right? It's, it's, a, it's typically a major event, but sometimes it can be a very minor event. And it's the thing that once it happens in the story, there's no going back to the first part of the story, right? Everything, in other words, has, has essentially been changed. Then what's the falling action that uh, proceeds or follows that climax? which leads us to the ending where we have the resolution, some sort of making sense of the narrative and the denouement. Um, a couple of terms that we haven't talked about in our class specifically, but maybe you have heard before and that I'll touch on a little bit are the first one being unreliable narrator. And this is typical of Melville. It's very typical of, of, of a, a, a contemporary of his, Edgar Allan Poe, uh, which, you know, maybe there's some sort of historical significance to that, like maybe the rise of the unreliable narrator uh, in the mid 19, you know, early to mid 19th century, maybe that has some sort of, uh, like I said, historical or real world parallels going on. But if we think about the narrator as unreliable, meaning he's not omnip omnipotent, meaning he's not perfect, meaning he is a fallible human being who, who tells us aspects of the story with a bias, with his own human fallibility, with uh, his, his human ability to be persuaded or to be incorrect or to, 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 to fall into unhealthy or unhelpful assumptions. Uh, if we know all of those things about our narrator, uh, then how does it change the way we understand aspects of the story? How does it change the way we see Bartleby, for instance? Because the narrator is in this almost incessant struggle of how he's, how he's perceiving Bartleby. And in a sense, Bartleby, well, not in a sense, really Bartleby gives him very little other than to say, very calmly and directly, I would prefer not to. So a lot of the extrapolations, a lot of the assumptions, a lot of the imaginations that the narrator has is based on what we know about him and what we're starting to see throughout the story about him. So if he's not reliable in the sense that he's not objective, that he's not dispassionate, and in fact, he says that he does get very impassioned about Bartleby's <laughs> nose, right? Um, then, then what does that tell us about him, again, and how we should look at this story? And then we have allusion, not illusion, you know, not like a ooh, smoke and mirrors, right? Allusion, which essentially is a fancy literary term for a reference to something else, usually another work of literature, but it can be a biblical reference, it can be uh, neoclassical references like to Cicero, uh, et cetera, uh, or even historically relevant references, right? Even the fact that they're on Wall Street and there are references to the streets in New York near Wall Street. Why, why have these references, right? Why the biblical references that Melville shares where he talks about being turned into a pillar of salt or about love one another? Uh, excuse me, about the old Adam versus the new Adam. Why? What is it telling us, again, about the narrator, about this story, about these characters? And you can just imagine who I assume to be Lumberg-like 
in this story. So I'll just leave that image on the right there. So I have several questions for you to consider. Uh, and I hope they help unpack Bartleby a little bit more because there's a ton of there's a ton to unpack in Bartleby, but there's also a ton to use, a ton that is fun to play around with when you write, when you talk, when you consider this text. Uh, the first one, and I, get, I guess this just came up for me rereading it. Uh, and, you know, it made me think about that whole like Chomsky notion of like how we're different than other animals and it's because we have abstract thought, but not really. Uh, is why the animal like qualities and behaviors. I mean, literally turkey, like we couldn't get more any, any more animalistic than that. But even nippers, right? Like it says that nippers looks like a cat. So we're assuming like catnip, right? And we know how, how cats, what catnip does to a cat versus like when, when catnip isn't around, how it changes the cat's personality. And think about how tur turkey and nippers have those sort of, uh, balanced, <laughs> chronologically balanced uh, personality changes throughout the day. Uh, and ginger nut too. Like I know ginger nut is not necessarily uh, immediately indicative of an animal, but the way that he moves, his, his, his sort of uh, quick, quick moving aspects, the fact that he's young and sort of assumed to be small, uh, he kind of gives us that squirrely, squirrelish kind of vibe, right? And so if that's the case, like, I guess the question I would ask is, is what animal then would Bartleby be? And what animal would the narrator be? Um, and why? <clears throat> the next question I have is, again, what do you make of this narrator throughout this story? How's he, I, 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 maybe I gave too much away and how he comes across <laughs> to me. But how does he come across to you and why? Um, do you think, sorry, my dog's trying to play, play tent, tug of war with me. She's outside of the video screen. Um, how does he come across to you? Do you think that there's a sort of rationalizing on his part in the way that he deals with Bartleby, right? Think about how he keeps having to come back to these discussions of religion and faith as they pertain to his approaching Bartleby. Think about how he feels once his peers, not, not, his, not his minions, right? Not the people who work below him, but his peers, the other people in sort of the law and title community, how they start to perceive him once they catch wind of this situation with Bartleby. How does that, influence the way that we as the readers look at him and the opinion we have of him. Maybe it doesn't do anything at all, but, but it, you know, we got to think about it. Um, what about the way that <laughs> the nippers in Turkey uh, approach Bartleby uh, or, or even, you know, once, once Bartleby is left to his own devices in the office, how the other lawyers and 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 property people that come in how they do how they approach Bartleby um you know there's that scene where uh I believe it's Turkey says he's gonna like punch him in the face <laughs> like he's like oh, I'll punch him in the face like they're in an office you know what do you make of all that um were there points in the story that made you laugh and if so where were they and what was funny about them I think, I think the story is funny, but like, I'm an old dork, I could always say. So you could, you know, you could find this completely not amusing whatsoever. Uh, and think about that phrase that Bartleby repeats, I would prefer not to, or it's slight rewordings throughout the text. Uh, and when those rewordings happen, like people, you know, I don't think people realize the preciseness of language when it is meant to be precise and the deliberate decisions that writers when they're crafting characters and scenes make in terms of util utilizing language. But Bartleby says, typically says, I would prefer not to, but he sometimes switches it up. And so it's, an, it, 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 it's a helpful, 
it's a helpful thing to, to, to consider when he slightly changes up the phrasing of that and why that might be, you know, how does, I would prefer not to uh, differ from, I will not, right? Or, or I, you know, uh, some other phrasing of it. Think about the exact way that words are used. <clears throat> um, what do you make of it? How do you feel about it? And again, the, the, the reasons why he says it, the effect that it has on the people around him, does it make you think of anything in your own life, in the real world? Or is it just like so weird <laughs> that you're just like, what the heck? All right. Um, some more questions, right? <clears throat> Again, if we're talking about repetition, why does Melville repeat certain words? I've talked about this kind of enough so far in this video, so I won't push that one too much, but I want you to think about it. Uh, what do you make of Bartleby? Do you lean more toward liking Bartleby or disliking him? And why? Again, if you think about like, it, he's this guy existing in 1853. Let's, let's put him in a time machine and transport him to 2021. Uh, what would he be like today? Like, what would he do for a living? What would his social media presence look like? How do you think he would dress or act? Like this stuff kind of always fascinates me because, uh, you know, as contemporary readers, we didn't live in the 1850s. We weren't alive or around at that time. And so to sort of the, one of the, one of the things I've always loved about reading literature is being able to put ourselves in that story or sort of, you know, after we're done reading the story, find those parallels to the present day that we can make, because that's sort of one of the points of literature, right? Is that it's, or good literature anyway, is that it's timeless and that it can apply to any number of situations, past or present. Again, think about some ironic statements that the narrator makes or ironic scenarios, meaning like dramatic irony that play out in the story. Uh, what do you make of them and how do they make you feel? And I mentioned that ending briefly, right? What do you make of the ending? Considering now that you know the whole story and you know what, what becomes of Bartleby, right? Um, what do you make of that? So, you know, think about that. And then finally, uh, some of you may notice <laughs> that the phrase I would prefer not to is my little, my Zoom avatar. <laughs> and uh, the, the image that that silhouette is, is actually a guy named Slavish Zizek. And I'm an American, so I'm probably butchering his name. Uh, but he has a book called The Parallax View. And in that book, he basically talks about how, I mean, he talks about a lot of things, but in one part specific to his discussion of Bartleby the Scrivener, uh, he talks about how in order to combat epistemic or systemic violence enacted, upon, uh, enacted by those in power, uh, we need to engage in what he refers to as Bartleby politics, which, which is always fun. Uh, this, this notion of you know, being political Bartleby's. <laughs> Um, he states Bartleby's I would prefer not to is the necessary first step in sort of confronting this aggression or violence or oppression, whatever you want to call it, um, which as it were clears the grounds, clears the ground, opens up the place for true activity, for an act that will actually change the coordinates of the constellation. And this is how Zizek writes all the time. Like he's not going to just like say like, here's what we should do, right? He always has this very sort of flowery theoretical language. Some people accuse him of being a charlatan. I personally find him engaging. So, you know, to make, make what you will of, of my utilization of Zizek and these final thoughts. <clears throat> so thinking about this idea, right? Sort of being political Bartleby's. Do you agree with Zizek that refusing to engage within a framework of oppression is one of the best forms of rebellion we have or, or not, right? In other words, 
right? We could, we can engage in any number of rebellious acts. We could march, we could, uh, we could, I mean, people stormed the Capitol this year. Whether I'm not saying that I agree with their politics by any stretch of the imagination, but that was a political act uh, of, of rebellion. Uh, you know, and, and essentially what Zizek is saying is like, you know, those just, those just serve to kind of keep this, uh, this framework going, even though they may appear to be rebellious on some level, all they're doing is sort of continuing this framework, continuing this status quo. And what Bartleby does, right, by saying no, by saying I'm not going to participate even as an act of rebellion is one of the most radical things that a person could do in as protest. Um, and again, I'm, I'm saying it in highly simplified terms, but for the sake of not making this a three hour video, uh, thinking about that, about just dissing, you know, to, to quote Meredith Marks from the Real Housewives of Salt Lake City, disengaging as opposed to actively fighting back. Um, do you think that there is merit to that? given the, you know, the 2021 framework we're looking at. I mean, you can look at it in the 1853 framework where we're, you know, just a couple of years before the civil war and, you know, all kinds of things going on politically in the United States. Um, but think about it in a 2021 framework. If we were to be Bartleby's in our own right, would that, would that somehow be radical? And if so, how? Oh, it's your opinion, not mine. I'm, yeah, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not going to be like the commenters on my YouTube page and tell people that you know their opinions are wrong because that's stupid. But um, these are, you know, I hope this helps and I hope it unpacks what can be a complicated and challenging text in a way that's palatable and accessible. Uh, I'll take it off. Stop share now. Again, if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, meaning one of my students, thank you commenters, uh, please feel free to email me, uh, Zoom me, Canvas message me, just don't pronto me and don't leave snarky snide comments on my YouTube because I'll just be in a bad mood one day and say something really crummy right back. I will be the anti-Bartleby, right? Because I will... <laughs> I will not disengage and I'll be equally as bratty back to you. Um, God, it's stupid. I'm stupid. You know, like, I, I guess I agree with my commenters. Like on the most part, I'm just a knuckle dragging imbecile, but that's okay. I'm teaching you English. So I hope, uh, I hope all of that is working out beautifully. <laughs> uh, I hope also that you all have a wonderful evening, day, rest of your week or weekend, whatever the heck is going on in your life right now. I hope you are thriving and not just surviving. And uh, yeah, hit me up with questions arise. All right. See y'all in cyberspace. Bye.